This video is the lecture for Chapter 2, Input Processing and Output. You can read over the chapter topics as you're re reading the chapter. All right, designing a program. The first step, designing a program, is to create your flowcharts for pseudocode. Well, we're going to use pseudocode in this book, and then we're going to take that pseudocode, type it into a flowcharting program called Flowgorithm, and then we're going to run that code to see if our logic is correct. After you, when you run the code, if you get an error, that's called a syntax error. After you got all the syntax errors out, if you run it and it does not working correctly, that's called a logic error. All right, the code that you're typing in is called the source file, and once you get all the syntax errors out, it creates an object file. It, of course, they call it debugged if you know if something's wrong. Here's the steps. Okay, it's called the program development lifecycle. You design the program, then you write the code, correct the errors test it, and then debug. If there's a debug error, you start back over. You don't start back over as far as writing the whole program. You just fix the errors. And then if there's any more syntax errors, you keep correcting them until you get rid of them. After you get rid of all the syntax errors, you test the code. And if it works, then you're done with it. There's two steps in designing a program. Understanding the task. Hey, there's no way you can design a program if you don't understand the task. you got to know what it's asking for. When you read the lab sheets, and if it doesn't make sense what it's asking for, contact me and I'll tell you what it's asking for. Then you have to determine the step that must be taken to perform the task. That's called an algorithm, which is a step-by-step -step direction to solve the problem. And again, we're going to use pseudocode to solve it. Pseudocode is fake code used as a model for programs. There's no syntax rules. Well-written pseudocode can be easily translated into actual code. In pseudocode, to display something on the screen, you're going to use the display statement. To get something from the screen that the user types in, you're going to use the input statement. The set statement is used to do an assignment statement. An assignment statement takes what's to the right of the equal sign and stores it to the variable on the left of it. And on that set statement, you can see what it's going to do. It's going to multiply the hours times the pay rate and store it in a variable called gross pay. And then it's going to output to the user what the gross pay is. Notice the last display statement. It's got the gross pay is dollar sign. That's going to show up exactly like it's in between the two quotes. The comma is a concatenation character. That says I want you to tie this quote with whatever's behind it. In this case, it's a variable called gross pay. In Flowgorithm, when you go to do a concatenation character, you have to use the ampersand sign. Flowchart is a graphically lit representation of your code, or your logic, I should say. Notice the terminator, that's the start and end. Or in some exact books, you'll see the start and stop. Parallelograms used for input and output. The rectangle is used for processes, which is an assignment statement. You can look at the flow chart in figure 2.2 and see that the, the user is going to see enter the number of hours the employee worked. Then they're going to enter the hours. Once they hit the enter key, they're going to see enter the employee's hourly pay rate. And then they'll enter the pay rate and hit enter. And then the program is going to calculate gross pay and then output it back out to the user. That's all this program is going to do. You have a flowchart connector symbol, which is a circle. And, you know, notice how that label A. What that's saying is this flowchart ends right here at A, and it connects to the next page or somewhere else on the A. It's just like a continuation if you have a big flowchart. All, pay, all page connector symbol is like a home plate. And again, you, do letter, you did letters on the previous one. Of all page, you do numbers. Output, input, and variables. Of course, everybody knows what output is. It's data that is generated. Variables is storage, location, and memory for data. Computer programs typically follow three steps. You get input, process it, and output it. Not every program you will process. Not every program you'll get input. Not every program you'll get output. But typically, those three are included in the majority of your programs. All right, so in this example, hours worked is the input and hourly pay rate. The process is multiplying it to get the gross pay, and the output, of course, is gross pay. The IPO chart, you'll see examples of this in here. I don't require you to do this, but, you know, this is good documentation for you to, to help you write your programs. And I already told you about the display keyword, and notice what happens at the bottom of the page where it says 1, 2, and 3. The program is going to execute step 1 first, so it displays Kate Austin. Then it's going to go down to the next line, display one, two, three, four, Walnut Street, and then go down to the next line, Asheville, North Carolina, 28899, and then the program's going to end. Whatever's in between the quotes, that's called a string literal. 
it's going to display exactly like you have it in there. So if your output has a typo in it, it's because in your display statement you put a typo. All right, so make sure you go back there and fix it if you need to. The input is a keyword to take values from the user. And again, that value you're going to get from the user when they type it in and hit enter, you're going to store it in a variable that's already in memory because that, you're going to have it create that. So in this example, the user is going to see what is your age. They're going to enter in the age. And then they're going to see here's the value that you entered, and then you're going to see the age. Notice this is not concatenated. What that means is it's not tied together on the same line. It does two separate lines. You could just as easily put the comma in there and put age on the line three and not have to do line four. Again, that's preference. Whatever the program asks for in the book, you do it that way. If it doesn't ask for a particular way, you do it whichever way you want to as long as you're consistent. Programmers can define variable names following certain rules. It must be one word with no spaces. Generally, punctuation characters are avoided. Generally, the first character cannot be a number. Name a variable, something that indicates what may be stored in it. We're going to use camel case as the naming convention. That's what industry standard is. Camel case is the first letter of the first word is lowercase, and the first letter of all subsequent words are uppercase. It's like that example. The C in camel is lowercase, and the C in case is uppercase. So if you had first name as a variable, the F would be lowercase, and the N in name would be uppercase. If you... Don't follow camel casing. I will count off for that. You can see in the uh, video that's in Chapter 1 assignments that explains how I'm going to do the grading. It tells you all this. On this example, they're taking a variable, setting the price to 20. So they got to declare a variable and, and then going to do the initial value 20. A variable assignment does not always have to come from the user input. It can be set through an assignment statement. So uh, they're setting price to 20 because that's the assignment statement. So it's taking the 20, what's on the right of the equal sign, storing in the variable price. In program 2.6, they're setting dollars to 2.75, and then they're outputting that out. Then they're setting dollars to 99.95 and outputting that out. That works fine. But the problem with this is that that's all that's going to ever show in this program. You know, the better way to do it would be let the user enter in the dollars. You know, that way it can you can use the program multiple times. Calculations are performed using math operators. As you can see in the table, the plus is addition, the minus is subtraction, the asterisk is multiplication, the forward slash is division, mod is modulus, and the caret top is exponent. Look what mod says. Divides one number by another and gives the remainder. So if you do a division, it gives you the whole number and the remainder. If you do a mod, it only gives you the remainder. So, for instance, if you do a mod and the remainder is 1, what would be stored in the variable would be 1. The exponent, of course, raises it to the power of of. So if you said caret top 3, it, whatever the variable was or the number was, it would go to the third power of that number. Or variable. A variable declaration includes the variable name and the data type. Data type it tells the computer what type of information you're storing in that variable. In pseudocode, they only they have four, really. They only list three here, but they have integer. That stores whole numbers only. Real stores whole and decimals. String is any series of characters. And they also have a Boolean value, which is true, either stores true or false. So here's the way you do it in pseudocode. Declare real is the data type and the variable name. If you wanted to give the initial value, you could say equals 1,000. And that would go ahead and put an initial value in there if, if the problem asked for that. And it says, for safety and to avoid logic errors, variables should be initialized to zero or some other value. That's what they're doing on lines six, seven, and eight. You don't have to in, a, in every programming language, but you have to in a lot of them. So that's why they're telling you, you know, it's not wrong if you don't do it. It'll still work. You know, worst case scenario, it'll give you an error saying, hey, this value must be initialized. And again, some programming language it will do that, some it'll work fine. So what this is doing is creating four variables in memory called test one, test two, test three, and average. Then they're setting test one, two, and three. Then they're calculating the average. They're adding up the three tests, then dividing it by three. So well, how do I know that? Because the parentheses says, I want you to do parentheses first. If they didn't have the parentheses around around the, the test one, two, and three, it would take test three and divide it by three and then add test one and two to it. Because anytime you do a calculation, it used the order of precedence. 
I know some of y'all are familiar with please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. It will do parentheses first, then exponent second, and then multiplication and division third and fourth, but they're on the same level. And then addition and subtraction last that they're on the same level. So, for instance, what I mean by the same level, if you have an assignment statement that has all multiplication and division, it's going to start to the left and work its way to the right. But again, the parentheses can change the order of that. And then they, that note, line number 10 just outputs it. A name constant. A name constant is pretty much self-explanatory. It's constant. That means you can't change it. If you tried to change a name constant, you'd get an error. The, in, in pseudocode, you do constant, then the data type. Notice the name in standard on uh, constants. And you have all uppercase word letters with each word separated by an underscore. So you have a constant in, in memory after this statement with point uh, with zero point zero six nine. That that's equivalent to six point nine percent. Okay, so if it tells you to do it, you know twelve percent, it'd just be point one two. Hand tracing. This is a real good example on how if you want to desk check before you go type it in, which is a a, a good practice to keep you from getting so frustrating. This gives you an example of how to hand trace. And I don't spend much time on this because I don't require y'all to do that. Flogarithm is kind of like our desk check. But again, that's showing you what, at each line, what the values will be in each variable. Notice you have four variables. Over there on the right in the chart, there's four variables. You have nine lines. The chart has nine lines. So you can step through that. And if it doesn't make sense to you, call me or you know contact me and we'll go over it. External documentation describes aspects of the program for a user, sometimes written by a technical writer. Internal explains how the program works, the name of the program, and so, so on and so forth. Comments must be included, and you'll see on the, that video what I expect. At the top of your code, I expect the, you know, the name of the program, a brief description, the, whoever wrote it, and the date it was written. Internally, on every module that you have, I expect a brief description at the top of that module, explaining what that module does. All right, designing your first program. They want you to calculate the batting average for any player, and they give you the algorithm. Batting average equals hits divided by times at bat. You have to determine what is required for each phase of your program. You must determine what your input is, what must be done with it, and what your output is. So if you get your input, and most of these examples will tell you exactly what your input is, and they'll tell you what they want outputted. So you take your input, you look at your output. If it's not on your input, but they want it on your output, then you've got to calculate it. That's just the way, that, that's, that's in every program. If Compare your input to your output. What's not, what's not on your input that you need on your output, you've got to calculate it. It's that simple. All right, so the input received is the number of hits and the times at bat. What they want output is the batting average. Well, they didn't get the they didn't get the batting average from the input, which means it's got to be processed. And that explains it like that. So here's the three declares, hits, at bats, and batting average. And this is the way you get it. You know, notice how the comment they have here, get the number of hits, display, and input. So to get something from the user, you want a display statement to tell the user what to input, and then you want the input statement to grab it from the user and put it in memory. So they got the hits and at bats. Then on line 15, they calculated it. In line 18, they outputted it. And then once you do that, you've got to test it. Like you've got to get a calculator or whatever. So do something that you can do in your head. You know, like for instance, say, oh, they, they got 100 hits at 1,000 at bats. So you know that would be the batting average would be 0.10. It would be 100, you know, 100. That's it. You know, don't make up some number and have to get your calculator. Something you can divide pretty easy. And this is the flow, flow chart for this. And, and I've zoomed through that because we're going to do pseudocode. We'll talk more about that later. All right, so the summary is, there's your input, processing, and output. I've already talked about that. Complete the Chapter 2 lab sheet that's located in the Chapter 2 section in Blackboard. So you, you go to Blackboard, Chapter 2, find the lab sheet and download it and go open up the lab sheet and complete it. And this is the lab sheet, lab 1.1. I want you to write a program that will take basic information from a student, including the student name, degree name, number of credits taken so far, and the total number of credits required. I want you to write a program that will take in basic information from a student, 
including student name, degree name, number of credits taken so far, and the total number of credits required in the degree program. The program will then calculate how many credits are needed to graduate. This place should include the student name, degree name, and credits left to graduate. Output should include the student name, degree name, and credits left to graduate. So if you read this carefully, which I, you know, I'd read a couple, two or three times to understand it, but if you read it, it tells you what the input is. Student name, degree name, number of credits taken so far, total number of credits required in the degree program. It tells you what you need to calculate, credits needed to graduate. It tells you what you need to output, student name, degree name, and credits left. So you've got your four variables you need to, for the input. It tells you you need to uh, calculate credits left or whatever you want to call it. So you're going to have five variables, output statement. Again, you can put them in three separate output statements or you can put them all in one output statement and use the concatenation to go down to the next line. Of course, you'd have to Google that or look farther ahead because you won't know that to this point. Then you go to step one. It kind of breaks down the step. In pseudocode, get means get something from the user. That's the input. Calculation, you know, it tells you number three. The output is the display. So remember on the get, input, so that tells you on down step two. What's, what logic error do you spot and how would you fix it? So you look at those steps and, and there, it tells you there's a, there is a logic error. So you got to determine what that is and then fix it. Step three, what steps require user inter interaction? I just kind of told you that, right? What keyword to look for. Then lab two, it tells you the, f the five variable names. So when you get done answering all these labs, you're going to have your pseudocode to take over to Flogarithm and type it in and test it. So you have to look at these and see if there's a problem. You say, well, how do I know? You look back at the, the naming standards and see if it has a naming problem. You look at the data type and see if they match what information is going to be stored in there. And right here it says display enter student name. So you got to determine what would be next. Well, they want the students to enter the, they want the user to enter the student's name. So how do you get it back? Remember I told you that was input statement. So you look over those. And here's the one most common mistake. It says what two things are wrong with this calculation. And a lot of students will just put one thing, so it says two things. And write the exact output that you will see. So you got to look at the thing talking about concatenation and all that and write down exactly what's going to show up, assuming that the user input Bill Jones, because it tells you that. And then you take steps one, two, three, and four and just basically copy it down to on here, and then add the other output statements. Then you, you do that, put it in Flogarithm, and it tells you what to name it. It tells you to name it CH2 Lab 1. Now here's Lab 2, Programming Challenge. So you read that, write the pseudocode, take that pseudocode, type it into Flogarithm, and, and run it. Then, but look down here, it says zip the lab sheet, and the two flogarithm programs into a file called last name ch2. Of course, you substitute your last name for that, like mine would be Cantrell ch2, and submit that file into Blackboard. If you submit three separate things, I'm going to give you a zero and make you do it right. If you miss, if you skip one, I may go ahead and grade it and just count off and tell you, you know, resubmit that other part for a grade up. But, but don't submit it until you got the lab sheet and the two programs done. All right, I hope that help some. If you have any questions, contact me and we'll talk about it. I can even do a WebEx if I need to, you know, whatever, whatever help I can do to give it to you. My job is to help you succeed. So, you know, make sure you read the chapters, look over the PowerPoint. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot.